Can you hear me back there? Are we good? Good to go. Okay. Um, hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us at CFRI's inaugural Pediatric CF Education Conference. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Sue Landgraf, Executive Director of CFRI. And I am delighted and I'm very honored to welcome all of you here today. It's going to be a very exciting and rewarding day for all of us. So thank you so much for spending your day with us. Thanks to progress in medical research and therapies, those with CF are living longer, healthier lives. Thanks to nationwide newborn screening programs, babies with CF are benefiting from medical care in their earliest of days. Those of us here in this room are linked as a community due to our shared passion to improve the lives of our loved ones touched by CF, as well as our relentless drive to find that cure. Our theme today is Navigating the CF Road, Tools to Help Your Child Thrive. The writer Jeffrey Anderson noted, we have another chance to navigate, perhaps in a different way than we did yesterday. We cannot go back, but we can learn. By day's end, you will have learned more about the latest in CF research and therapies, asked questions of some caring experts, and connected with others who understand the ups and downs of life with CF. Truly a CF journey in one day. They say that a speaker should always know her audience. Now I know quite a few of you, but I hope by the end of today I have met all of those that I do not know. For now, I would love to know a little bit more about your CF experience, but I need your help. Could you all please stand? This is the interactive part. <laughs> There's lots of interactive parts, but this is the fun part. If your child or loved one's diagnosis came over 10 years ago, please sit down. Now, I would be sitting down if I had a chair. If the diagnosis came over five years ago, please sit. If the diagnosis came between one and five years ago, please sit. And Kristen, you can sit, I guess. <laughs> yeah, there we go. So while there is a range of ages represented here from, you know, uh, toddlers to adolescents, we can all learn from and support one another along the CF road. Now that I know a bit more about you, I will share a bit about me. I've been the ED of CFRI since 2013, but my relationship with CF and CFRI began many, many years ago. My daughter was diagnosed with CF at 22 months old, and we became involved with CFRI when she was about four years old. And that's when I first met Ann Robinson down in Monterey at the Parade of Champions horse show. I always like to bring that up because I'll never forget that day, and that's when I met Marion Rojas as well, so it, that was a long time ago. Um, my daughter is now 30 years old. She's happily married, she's been to college, she's worked, she is a true delight. But I know the unpredictable twists and turns of CF that can turn your world upside down. Through our journey, CFRI has provided my family with information, support, community, and hope. It is my great hope that you will experience the same. Before you leave today, I hope you will visit the CFRI table, which is over there in the corner, and learn about our many programs, including a support group for caregivers, free counseling services, our upcoming national conference, which I believe you all have a brochure on the table, and our many educational materials. CFRI is here for you. We are your partner in living. I want to express my sincere gratitude to Vertex Pharmaceuticals for sponsoring this conference. Holly Devlin from Vertex will be here at lunchtime to meet with you. I also wish to express my warm thanks to our exhibitors, activists, Chiesa USA, Cystic Fibrosis Services Incorporated, and Foundation Care. I hope you'll take uh, time later today, lunch, the breaks, to meet with their representatives and learn about their products and services because they contribute so much to taking care of our children and our loved ones. Please join me in giving them a round of applause. I also want to acknowledge what I call my superstar team. They made this day possible, and I would like them to stand and be recognized. Siri Vaith Dunn. Yeah. 
Mary Convento, I believe Mary is outside still at registration, so for Mary. Scott Wakefield behind the camera. And I would like to thank David Suhu, David. Dave, David is our former programs and operations director for CFRI and he, has, he retired in February. I really tried to bribe him to stay, but he decided to go and retire on us. But he is returning to assist us today, so thank you, David. And here comes Gina. Yay, Gina. <laughs> We will be having some late arrivals throughout the day, so uh, we're always glad to see you. Thank you, Gina. Um, before we get started, I wanted to let you know that due to a, a severe, very sad family crisis, Lisa Green is unable to be with us today, and our thoughts are with Lisa and her family, so she unfortunately will not be with us. And now I am delighted to introduce our first speaker. Jeff Wine, PhD, is a professor of human biology and the director of the Cystic Fibrosis Research Laboratory at Stanford University. His cystic fibrosis was sparked by his daughter's diagnosis with CF in 1981. Since 1987, Dr. Wine has studied genetic and cellular aspects of CF in humans and animal models, and he and his colleagues have led many groundbreaking discoveries in the field of CF to increase understanding of the disease in ways that will improve treatment for our loved ones. Please help me to welcome Dr. Jeff Wine. Thank you, Jeff. Here we go. I'll take my water. Thank, with there you go. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, Sue, and thank those of you who have um, come today, especially the doctors in the crowd who, although they are speaking later, needn't have come this early, so I appreciate that. If I did the proper head count, this talk is actually going to be directed at only one person in the whole room, and that is a parent of a newly diagnosed uh, child. Um, I first gave this talk at a plenary session in 2008, and this is simply an update of that talk. It's most relevant to people with young children before those children have become infected chronically with CF. So keep that in mind as I go through uh, the talk. The real question is, we know that this is the molecule that when defective causes cystic fibrosis. And we know that the lungs are the primary target, the, the, the weak link in CF uh, life. So what can we as parents do to keep our children healthy? There are no simple recipes. And the best thing you can do mostly is to follow CF care team guidelines. Those give the best outcomes. But different doctors give different advice. And that's why we get second opinions. And so we can't avoid the responsibility of making the most informed choices uh, possible. How do you do that? Well, one way is to come to conferences like this. And I congratulate Sue and the CFRI community for their efforts in making this happen. I actually think if a study could be done, one would find that the children of parents who attend these meetings or listen to them do better than those who do not. And the real reason for that is not perhaps listening to people like me talk, but by talking to other CF adults and parents, uh, parents of older children. Those are extremely experienced sources of information, and I credit the longevity of my daughter in large part to advice I have heard from other parents, including prominently um, uh, Ann Robinson, and later in the talk you'll hear about a mother from Finland who made a very important uh, suggestion to us about our daughter's care. So it is in this spirit that the present talk will present the view about maintaining healthy lungs. This is not standard of care, but it's, I think, slowly being adopted, much too slowly in my view. Uh, and I think the results have been a steady improvement in lung function and longevity. So why am I up here? It's important to emphasize I am not a physician. We have some physicians in the room, and they're the ones that you should direct 
tough question still. But I am a parent and a CF researcher, and that's what's guiding uh, this talk. Do I have a way to uh, move this forward with just a clicker? Or do I have to do something different? I have my own clicker if we need it. There it is. Should be advancing it. Yes, thank you. Okay, so um, is it possible to keep CF lungs healthy? Well, what you see here is a woman finishing the swim portion of a triathlon. One of the reasons I'm showing you this is one of the most important things to stay healthy with CF lungs is exercise. So uh, after finishing the swim portion, we see her looking very determined in a biking event. And finally, we see her at the finish line. And uh, she looks um, pretty um, relaxed after having run for a mile and biked for almost 25 miles and run for uh, six miles. Um, most of us can't do that. And of course, the reason I'm showing you this young athlete is that she has cystic fibrosis. She's uh, 31 years old in this picture. She has severe mutations. She was pancreatic insufficient since birth, high sweat chloride, and she's had chronic aspergillus fumigatus in her airways for 31 years. So um, how, what's the secret here? Uh, how was this level of health uh, maintained and can we generalize from it? The case I'll try to make today is that this is in large part due to a lifelong battle to minimize uh, CF lung infections. So that's the title of the talk, Keeping CF Lungs Infection-Free, and I'm gonna make four assertions. The first is that in CF, lung function decline is caused by infections, and therefore, it's essential to give prevention the highest priority. Basic research, I will argue, provides some clues about how to do that, and chronic infections will, can be prevented with available treatments. This is a big thing. What we have today, while we're waiting for the big breakthrough drugs that are on their way, um, we can still do something uh, right now. So I used to belabor this uh, chart that shows how you go from a defective CF gene to uh, CF lung disease through all of these stages that have to do with altered secretions. And you will hear later on, later on in the day, especially I think from Dennis Nielsen, about how targeting this area right here is now the most exciting area of CF research. But if you notice these arrows, they have some feedback effects. That is, once infection infl and inflammation set in, those can then make things worse. These are called feedback effects. So the question today for us is, what happens if we intervene here to prevent infections? Will the intrinsic CF processes still destroy the lungs or not? Well, if we look to other organs for guidance, unfortunately it's not helpful. We know that obstruction and destruction in some CF organs occurs without infections. For instance, the pancreas, uh, and the sperm duct are both destroyed without any infection involved very early uh, in life. Um, on the other hand, if we look at the sweat glands, uh, this is a control sweat gland and this is a CF sweat gland. The CF sweat gland has greatly altered physiology, but if you look at these two, you can't tell the difference. That's because, of course, it's the same picture. But uh, even <laughs> if it weren't, uh, those would be uh, the same. So the CF sweat glands maintain their uh, structure and function, partial function, throughout life. So what about the lungs? Do they show intrinsic damage like the pancreas? Or are they more like the sweat glands, normal and less damaged by infection and inflammation? Well, until recently, and then with, with just a small number of cases, we don't really know the answer to this because we don't have anybody who's lived their life without infections. But we have people who have lived them with small amounts of infection, and they suggest that the answer is this. That cystic fibrosis is really two diseases, 
one in which there are acute infections that are, are uh, managed immediately and most CF is chronic infections. With acute infections, it appears that there is very little decline in lung function or weight or strength and therefore the treatment is to prevent infections and when they occur to eradicate the bacteria. Once the infections are established, chronically infected lungs tend to decline in lung function with variable rates. The treatment here now is maintenance antibiotics to try to keep the infection at some acceptable level. My idea of an acceptable level is zero infection. And then you treat exacerbations when the person uh, gets sick. So I'll just give you because we're parents primarily and not scientists, I'm not going to belabor the evidentiary portion of this talk. I'll give you just one piece of evidence for why controlling infections we think is so important. <coughs> this shows the age and years, the, uh, the lifespan of people with cystic fibrosis, which has shown this increase over the years from the time that CF was first uh, recognized until the present time. And it's a very complicated slide. You don't need to look at it all. I just want to make this point. After the introduction of pancreas enzymes, which are necessary but not sufficient for longevity in 90% of people with CF, after that, almost all increases in longevity follow the better management of airway disease. Okay? That's where, that's where the battleground is. So, what is it that makes chronic airway infection so, destruction, so destructive? This shows a CF lung after it's been removed at time of transplant. These are right up there where all the airways, air comes in to get to the rest of the lung. And you can take a look at this and you can see that there's not much air that's going to get in there, which is why the person's lungs had to be removed. So, seven features of CF airway infections. People with CF die from these airway infections primarily. And the airway infections are bacterial, not viral, although viral infections are serious because they can predispose to bacterial infections. I'm going to take these for granted, and then we're going to spend some time on the next five points. Bacteria are found in mucus, not in the airway surface. I'll go through these as we go through. So they're found in the mucus, not in the airway surface. So why is that important to know? Why is it important to know that the bacteria are in the airway surface? Think about that for a minute. I'm first going to show you the evidence that that's true, and then I'm going to come back and ask you that question again. So this shows the lungs, and that's one of the tubes uh, in the lungs that carries air to the rest of the lungs where it's really needed. And this uh, is an expansion of that. And this little square here is magnified here. Now in this picture here, this is the airway wall, this is the mucus, this is a, an artifact, normally this mucus would be pressed right against the airway surface. These light oval colored regions here are shown magnified down here and what you can see is that those are called macro colonies of Pseudomonas aeruginosa growing all together in little clusters. The reason they're called macro colonies is because some of them get large enough to see with the naked eye. They don't have to be under a microscope. And this last graph here shows that most of these are more than five microns away from the surface of the airway lungs. Five microns is a big distance to a bacterium which is only one micron long. So it would be like having a bunch of people who are five foot tall and the closest area the one is to the wall is 25 feet. Question back to you. Why is this important for you to know as parents? You get that mucus out of there and the bacteria come with it. Okay, so she gets some kind of an extra croissant or something. All right, that's good. That's great. Okay. So. The next point is that bacterial infections are heterogeneous. They start high and they move low. And when I tell you things like this, I'm telling you usually, okay? So they start high and they, they move low. Why is this important? 
Well, for the last uh, five years or so, we, there's been a focus in my laboratory on the nasal passages. And several uh, meetings ago, you guys had Peter Wang who spoke here, who's an outstanding otolaryngologist at Stanford. And it would be well to have him come back because he gave a talk about how to keep the nasal passages clean. And I'm here to tell you that that should be one of the first and most important things that you do in CF care. And it's highly neglected, I think, uh, in a lot of CF care. Uh, often will be a throat swab to see if pseudomonas is there. What about the nose? The nose turns out to be critical because virtually all of the air that you breathe comes through the nose, all right? And in babies and in some uh, animals, it's almost 100%. So at the early stages of life, this is, the, this is the trajectory through which bacteria must pass. And for that reason, the nose is specially designed to make sure particles don't get through it and into the airways. It's filled with glands. It even has a special kind of gland that we're studying, not found anywhere else, that secretes tons of uh, antimicrobials. Uh, and the mucus traps the bacteria. It has all these um, funny structures so that the, there's a tortuous air path so that air is all bouncing around and particles are impacting against the wall and the bacteria get stuck there and then they're swallowed instead of going into the lungs. So you don't want to let polyps grow in the air in the nose so that the, the kid has to breathe through the mouth. Uh, and you, wanna, you don't want to let infections linger on there. Okay, so that's why it's important to know that most infections start high and move low. The next thing you have to know uh, about why you don't want to let an infection linger, that you want to get rid of it as fast as you possibly can, is that Pseudomonas evolves if it's not eradicated from a lung. What do I mean by that? Well, it turns out that Pseudomonas that lives out in the world has a lot of features that make it ideal for infection. It has this little tail that lets it swim, for example, and a whole bunch of other things that microbiologists have studied over the years. And if you get an acute infection, what happens is that this kind of bacteria swimming around multiplies very quickly in the lung. But then, if you get eradicated, then the lung is clean again until you get another infection from another piece of Pseudomonas on a lettuce leaf or something. But if you don't eradicate it immediately, then what happens is bacteria in the airways now are no longer on pieces of lettuce. They're inside the lungs, and your lungs are trying to kill them. Your CF doctor is trying to kill them. They don't want to die, so they start to mutate to resist all of this uh, attack, and that leads to a different kind of chronic phenotype in which the bacteria actually lose a lot of properties, gain some properties, and basically end up being the kind of bug that's extremely difficult to get out of the airways. So you don't want to let this happen. And to show you just how dramatic this is, we all think of evolution as taking a very long time. But bacteria, I'll talk about this later, grow very quickly. So this shows, a, 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 this had a tremendous influence on me when I saw it. This is a girl who was CF, who's eight years old, and from the time she's one year old, they kept taking samples of the mucus from her airways and looking at the pseudomonas in it. She was chronically infected with pseudomonas, and each one of these balls represents a different mutation in that pseudomonas. So by the time she was eight years old, she had a whole different creature in her lungs, the creature from the Black Lagoon. It had 68 different mutations that separated it from the bacterium that originally went into her airways. And we think the majority of those mutations are designed to let it stay in the lungs. So some of you have heard about mucoid pseudomonas, and some of you haven't. I'll tell you what it is in a minute. But after years of infection, you get conversion to mucoid form. So why is this important? So first of all, what is mucoid pseudomonas? Well, this is a, a Petri dish that's been streaked with pseudomonas on one side, the non-mucoid form, and the mucoid on the other side. Now, you don't want either one of these in your lung, right? 
But you definitely don't want this form, which has this uh, encapsulating slime that makes, um, does all, it does, you don't want it there. It's bad, okay? So how can we avoid this? Well, there's, this is a complicated slide, but I really think parents need to know this information. What this shows is the longitudinal development of pseudomonas infection and mucoid pseudomonas infection at a cystic fibrosis clinic in Wisconsin. Uh, patients running from 1985 to 2004. Now, this shows the percent of patients who had clean cultures, no pseudomonas, and by the age of 12, zero. So everybody's infected at this, at this clinic. This is the percent that have non-mucoid form. It goes up and then it starts to go down because the mucoid form goes up. So that now, by the age of 16, everybody in this thing, in this clinic has a mucoid form of pseudomonas, just about. Now, um, this is not a good thing. Notice that the transition time from non-mucoid to mucoid was relatively long, 11 years, and could be slightly extended by brief, low anti uh, pseudomonas antibiotic treatment. Well, it can be greatly extended by long and high anti-pseudomonas uh, treatment, which is what you want. Okay, finally, infection and inflammation leads to bronchiectasis. Why is this important and what is bronchiectasis? Bronchiectasis is when the cartilage in the airways start to dissolve. And what happens is that under normal airways, some of the men in the audience who have ever done plumbing know that when you have a high pressure uh, hose, you wrap it in a sort of a, a steel casing. And the airways have this kind of rigid structure around them. And that enables you to, when you blow out really hard, those airways stay nice and tight and let the air blow through it, and that's how you expel things from the airways. But in a bronchiectatic lung, those airways no longer behave that way. They're floppy, so they can dilate when you breathe in, and then they either dilate or collapse when we breathe out, and they create pockets for infections. So this is not good, and it's really not good because there may be new evidence on this, but. I think up till recently, it doesn't look as though this is reversible. So if you have bronchiectasis, it's really hard to go back in time. So you don't want bronchiectasis. Now we know that infections cause bronchiectasis, but the really scary thing is that bronchiectasis also increases infections. And we know that because there's a nature, nature has done an experiment for us, and that is there's a syndrome called Williams-Campbell syndrome, in which children are born without or very reduced cartilage in their airways. And with that, no other defect, but just the loss of cartilage in their airways, they develop thin-walled bronchiectasis, they cough, wheeze, and they get recurrent pulmonary infections, which makes their bronchiectasis worse. So this is exactly the kind of thing that we talk about as a vicious cycle. You have the basic defect that leads to infection, that gives you inflammation, tissue destruction, and bronchiectasis, and you get more infection, more inflammation, and more bronchiectasis, more infection, and around and around you go. That's not good. So what can we do about this? That's why we're here today. We don't want this to happen. So what you'll hear about later is the good news about Ivacaftor and Lumacaftor and even better drugs on the way that will stop this whole process cold by getting rid of the basic defect. And that's what we all want. That's what we can hope for. But until that happens, you want to do this. You want to minimize infections to the fullest extent possible to prevent this vicious cycle from being established. So how do we do that, right? So in our laboratory, what we've done is taken a clue this, is, this goes way back in my career. The question you ask is, why do all of us in this room, who have healthy lungs, 
have healthy lungs. Why? We're breathing in the same bacteria as people with cystic fibrosis, but our lungs don't get infected. So what do our lungs do properly by having CFTR that CF lungs don't do? Well, if you, this, here's an airway, and this is the schematic of the airway down here with the airway wall, the, the layer of mucus on the airway wall, and the airway lumen, which is clear and clean. And you can see all these little structures here. Those are ion channels that allow chloride and bicarbonate to come into the airway glands and into the airway surface to make this mucus slippery and make it uh, slide right out of the airway. They also make the wall slippery. This is a submucosal gland. This produces the mucus. And I call this mucus an elixir of airway health because in addition to having the mucin molecules, the structures that trap the bacteria physically, it's filled with all kinds of antimicrobial compounds. And our nervous system constantly barrages these, these glands so that they're secreting a little bit of mucus 24-7. So even when you're asleep, your airways are coating themselves with an antimicrobial mucus to keep themselves healthy. But in cystic fibrosis, this goes away. So we're left with a few uh, ways to get some fluid into the airways. Uh, some of us think that if these went away as well, probably CF would be an early lethal disease. But we have a little, we have a crippled defense system. Now the elixir of airway health is now uh, greatly diminished. The, the uh, the glands secrete less, not more. The mucus is thicker, and therefore, because it's not moving out rapidly and because it doesn't ha have the ability to kill bacteria, they proliferate in there, start to form these little plaques as we saw before. So reduced fluid anion secretion, thicker mucus, reduced killing, reduced clearance, infection, increased thick mucus, still decreased clearance, and around and around you go in a bad way. So what, what is this elixir of airway health that I'm talking about? Well, in our laboratory, we study this uh, gland secretions directly. So once they're on the airway surface, they get mixed with lots of other things. But uh, it's possible to get the little mucus bubbles right on the surface of airways from transplanted lungs uh, and to collect that mucus and analyze it with uh, a, a method that's not important, mass spectrometry. And when uh, we did that, when this guy did it, uh, in collaboration with John Engelhard at Iowa, we, we saw that there were at least 102 protective proteins in there. So when I tell you to give one antibiotic, your airways is producing more than 100 of different kinds of antimicrobials. So, we're, we went through these three assertions, and I'm now down to this last one. Chronic infections can be prevented by optimal use of available treatments. And so what are those? Here they are. Number one, optimize mucus clearance. Number two, start early. Number three, use multiple antibiotics. And four, I have a preference for inhaled antibiotics. So let me go through these quickly and tell you why I think each of these are critical components of keeping healthy CF lungs. There is no controversy about optimizing mucus clearance. <coughs> Everybody agrees that that's critical and uh, it's, it's, it really took off. It's always, I think, been considered to be important, but it really took off for me anyway when this um, review article by Mike Knowles and Rick Boucher appeared. What they identified is mucus clearance as a primary innate defense mechanism of the lung. So it's all by itself, it's, it's really critically important. So clearance, clearance, clearance. And how do you do this? Well, exercise is the most important. If you can't exercise, use a vest. Use hypertonic saline, use pulmazyme. And there are now, uh, there, in the pipeline, there are agents that are going to help mobilize mucus even more. Okay. So, take that for granted. Now, what about these other three? Now, let me tell you here, this is controversial. And the reason it's controversial is that antibiotic resistance is a major problem, and therefore, 
there's been resistance to the use of antibiotics. In my opinion, this view is exactly backwards. And the early methods of treating CF lung disease led to bacterial resistance. They didn't get rid of it. And here's why. These show bugs growing. You start with one, and real quickly you have a thousand, and then you have a million, because they grow exponentially. They keep doubling, all right? Now, a quick way to think about this is after every 10 doublings, you have a thousand times as many bacteria. So the question is, how long does it take for 10 doublings to occur? Well, uh, in the, or a thousand, if you have a thousand of these, a thousand of these, or 20 doublings, then you have a million bacteria. How long does that take? Well, in a laboratory culture, you get a million bacteria from one bacteria in seven hours. Now, fortunately, they grow more slowly in the airways. We don't actually know exactly how slowly they grow, but the estimates are um, about a day, 24 hours. So, um, in CF lungs, it would take about 20 days to go from one bacteria to a million. Or said differently, whatever you start with, you'll have a million times more 20 days later. So this shows that plotted, um, uh, plotted uh, logarithmically. This is what scientists likes to like to use. Each point here is 10 times the other point. And when you plot a logarithmic uh, growth, on such a scale, it, it makes this nice line. And this shows that if you have 30 doublings, then you go to a billion bacteria. So 30 doublings in the, in the CF airway would occur in about a month. Now, you could say, well, uh, since this is going up nicely, we'll just intervene. We'll just notice somewhere along here and intervene. But this is a log scale. If you look on the linear scale, what happens is that these little guys are lurking below the radar here until suddenly you get out here and then they shoot up. That's the nature of the beast, right? And so the old joke is, if you have a billion of something and, and it's growing exponentially every day, when do you have a half a billion? And the answer is the day before, okay? So this creates, so, so this process doesn't go forever, it has to stop, but when does it stop? When CF sputum, you get between 10 to the 8 and 10 to the 10, this is 10 billion bacteria per milliliter of CF sputum. A milliliter is one-fifth of a teaspoon. You don't want that many bacteria in your airways. The point here is that it's very hard to detect the growth of bacteria in the early stages when you could do most good against them. So what's the importance of using multiple? So all of this, uh, uh, let me keep going. The importance of using multiple antibiotics is that bacteria evolve resistance in many ways. I show four ways here, but there are many other ways too. And once a bacterium becomes resistant, it spreads quickly among a population of bacterium. To go back here, this one bacterium here is a resistant one. Maybe one in a million. So you get mutations in every 10 to the 8 replications, and mutations are more rapid, it is normally, and mutations are more rapid in biofilms and more rapid inside the airways. So suppose a million bacteria is resistant to your antibiotic. So you start with this, you use your antibiotic and kill all the green guys, but then you're left with the antibiotic resistance ones, which then grow uh, at a rate somewhat slower than before, but still pretty fast. So why multiple antibiotics? So this looks like complicated math, but it's pretty simple. If one in a million bacteria is resistant to the antibiotic you're using. The chances that it will be resistant to a second different antibiotic, uh, assuming these mutations are independent, is the product of these two. So one, if one in a million is resistant to one antibiotic, it takes one to the 
my, one of the twelfth or one, what is that? That's uh, 100, 100 billion, I think, to um, be resistant. Maybe that's a trillion. And if three antibiotics are applied simultaneously, then the chance of resistance is the product of 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 6, or 10 to the minus 18. So in other words, you would need about a million, million, million bacteria to have one that was resistant to all three of these antibiotics if they were used simultaneously. Now, there's a lot of bacteria in CF lung, but there is not 10 to the 18. 10 to the 18 ends up being about a million liters of CF sputum. So these numbers are somewhat fanciful, but you get the point. Three antibiotics is better than two, and two are better than one. And all of this is even better if you start when the population is really small, which means starting early, when there are not many bacteria around, and therefore the probability that any of them is uh, resistant is even smaller. Now, um, who uses this effective? I mean, this seems so straightforward to me that I can't understand why this hasn't caught on. Wouldn't you think people would be doing this? Well, not in CF very much yet, but AIDS has been converted from a lethal pandemic to an, an annoyance where people have HIV that doesn't progress to AIDS precisely by using this strategy. The way you cure, you don't cure, but the way you, sometimes you do, you, is that you lose at least three drugs from two classes to avoid creating uh, strains of HIV that are immune to single drugs. That's from the Mayo Clinic, and that's the standard of care for HIV now. Tuberculosis. Multi-drug resistant uh, and extensively drug resistant tuberculosis are generally thought to have high mortality rates. But now, they're being treated with a combination of at least four drugs to which the mycobacterium tuberculosis is like to be susceptible. Okay. Can anybody think of any other examples? I actually gave you an example earlier, but you may not have recognized it, so let me give it to you now. This is the way your healthy lungs keep healthy. So remember, your own lungs are producing lots of antimicrobial substances all the time. So they're not waiting until you're chronically infected to produce antibiotics. They're producing them before the bugs get there. And they produce a lot of them. Unfortunately, the ones in our lungs are not nearly as potent as the ones that we administer externally, but apparently they don't need to be. So what antibiotics should you use? This is where you need your doctors, right? <laughs> you, you can't decide on your own. None of us, uh, none of us know um, what antibiotic, well, in fact, I'm always way behind uh, my colleagues. Ann Robinson always knows the latest antibiotic before I do. Um, but I can give you, I can tell you a, a general strategy that you can use when you're thinking about this. So this shows a bacterium. And bacteria, like all uh, living organisms, uh, exist by taking some fundamental chemicals and turning them into DNA. The DNA is then turned into RNA. The RNA is then turned into protein that runs all the machinery in, in the cell, including building the cell wall and the cell membrane. All of this is done in bacteria, and all of these steps are essential. And if you block any one of them, you can kill the bug. And so. There's a class of, uh, of uh, antibiotics that work on this very early stage here to block this transition. Sep uh, Bactrim or Septra is an example of that. Maybe not so good for the lungs, maybe okay for the nose. Ciprofloxacin and levofloxacin uh, attack the DNA. Rafampin, something none of us ever experienced, uh, blocks this step from DNA to RNA. The protein synthesis is interfered with by tobramycin, azithromycin, and amikacin. 
And then colistin and polymyxin B punch holes in the cell membrane, very different from any of these. And finally, the cell wall is prevented from assembling by uh, drugs like ceftazidime or astreonine. Different classes that anything will be able to resist them all goes down. Not to zero, but it goes way down. Okay, so I think I've told you why multiple is good. I think I've told you why starting early is good. We all accept that uh, mucus clearance is good. But why is inhalation so important? Why is inhalation better than taking oral antibiotics or IVs? Well, it isn't always. But in early stages of infection, uh, especially for infections that are higher in the airways, then oral and IV are greatly uh, less uh, useful than inhaled. And here's why. Oral and IV antibiotics go to the blood. So of all the places in your body, the blood has the highest concentration. And then the antibodies go out to all the other regions and they have to cross the cell wall and get into the mucus of the airways. And although some of them have been designed to do that a little better, you're also getting high volumes of antibiotics in all your other organs. Antibiotics are not without deleterious effects on our bodies. And so what's the, uh, uh, the amount of antibiotic that you can put into the blood is limited. And that, that's limited by health reasons, and then only a fraction of that gets in the airway. It's just the opposite when you inhale them. Now, almost nothing leaves the airway, so your body and all the sensitive organs in your body, like your kidneys and your liver, are not exposed to inhaled drugs. They get a little bit because you swallow some of it. But there's a tremendously high concentrations in the airway. And so when a, a laboratory clinic says that a bug is resistant to an antibiotic, that resistance often applies. Well, it's always resistant, but the level of resistance is often irrelevant for an inhaled antibiotic. Okay, so let me just summarize these strategies that I've talked about so far. So this uh, shows a typical growth curve for bacteria that are inoculated into a beaker in the lab. They grow for this exponential phase. It'll do the same thing in the lung. And then they reach a stationary phase. And, and if they're just in a little dish, they'll start to decline because there's no nutrients. But in the lung, they'll stay at this stationary phase with some up and down for the life of the lung. Now, um, what can you do about this? Well, because, uh, because patients have learned to live with these things, what usually happens is uh, until there's some event like called an exacerbation, uh, whatever treatment's going on is just continued. And then at that stage, the treatment is increased. And so you get uh, an increase of antibiotic treatment, maybe an IV, and that suppresses this extremely high amount of um, bacteria. And then, that's go, then the treatment stops and it gradually climbs back up and you just keep doing that uh, throughout life. But an alternative is to start here, use multiple antibiotics, eradicate the infection, and um, then the next time the infection comes back, you're starting from a clean slate and that's preferable. So what's the evidence that doing this actually works and isn't harmful? And we don't have a lot of evidence, but I have one uh, example. It's a case study, I'm calling it that now, and it's based, the, the theory is this one from Andrew Kernege, you put all your eggs in one basket and then you really take care of that basket. So the next slide I'm going to show you is the most complicated slide uh, of the whole talk, but fortunately it's almost uh, the last slide. Um, this shows that runner that we saw uh, at the beginning uh, of the talk as she completes the first marathon she ever ran. And this is her life, uh, strung out in terms of bacterial cultures. Each one of these uh, square, these oblong uh, disks, is a six-month period of her life. If it's white, that means there was no infection detected. Uh, if it's green, that means there was a pseudomonas infection. 
If it's blue, it meant there was a stenotrophomonas infection, which is another kind of bug. And if it's red, it means there's an acromobacter infection. Acromobacter is like pseudomonas on steroids, okay? Now, this uh, girl was uh, hospitalized at six months of age with a pneumonia, and I'm not even sure what the pneumonia was. Uh, and that was her first and last hospitalization. So she's never been in the hospital again, and overnight. Um, and um, then what you can see here is that there's this long period of clearness. And in this period, um, she was taking antibiotics prophylactically. Those antibiotics were inhaled and they were mixed and they were administered after every cold. So people tell you antibiotics are no good for colds. And they're absolutely right. It has nothing to, a cold, to do with a cold virus. But it prevents the follow-on bacterial infections that happen so often when people with CF get cold. And then right at this period here, where this treatment stopped. Why did it stop? Because this stuff which was mixed up, not, it was not sold by a drug company for a lot of money, it was mixed up by the Stanford Pharmacy. And in 1996, they said, you're the only person that ever asks for this and we're not making it anymore. So at that point, Toby had been approved other drugs were approved, so we switched to these uh, other treatments. But also now we're entering the teenage years. And so for those of you who have newly diagnosed children, um, you have something to look forward to. Because, uh, <laughs> so that was a little rocky through here. Um, but um, during this time, we had Dr. Moss as um, our go-to guy, and every single one of these uh, pseudomonas infections was eradicated. There was sometimes some discussion about the procedure about how to do that, but they were all uh, eradicated. And at this point here, what happens, this was a marathon, and at this point, uh, she moved to um, Spain. That's the Spanish flag up there. And shortly after moving to Spain, she got uh, these uh, acromobacter infections, which you can see were lasting for about four years. I kind of went quiet during this period because it seemed to me that this qualified as a chronic infection, although you can see there's little white streaks of clean, uh, clean cultures in between. My interpretation of that is that the bacterial concentration was being kept low by the constant antibiotic treatment during this period, but we were using the wrong antibiotics. How did I know that? Well, a mother of a CF child told me. A woman who lives in Finland said, I heard, and she proceeded to tell us about the Danish protocol for treating a chromobacter, which we went into um, a clinic will, which will not be named, but it's in the United States. And uh, they said, we're not prescribing this drug for you because you're completely healthy. But fortunately, she went back to Spain. They gave her the drug. And the drug did exactly what we had prayed it would do. It eliminated this acromobacter. And so all these cultures since then uh, have been clean. So lung structure is pretty good, although that's not perfect. And uh, lung function is tested by running uh, marathons. So to summarize, healthy airways are uh, keeping themselves healthy by this whole set of procedures that trap, inhibit, kill, and remove bacteria. CF airways don't do these things nearly as well. They don't, they don't it's not zero, but they don't do them as well. Uh, and so, if we're missing mucus clearance and we're missing antimicrobial action, what do you do? Well, if you're missing pancreatic enzymes, you replace them. So if you're missing those things from the airways, you replace them. So inhaling antibiotics and increasing mucus clearance is for a person with CF 
analogous to taking pre pancreatic enzymes. It's replacement therapy. And just as with pancreatic enzymes, you don't wait until you're in great distress before you take your enzymes. You take them all the time. So to summarize, there's two kinds of cystic fibrosis. It's easy to go from this kind to this kind. It's very hard to go backwards, but not impossible. There's uh, new reports that show you can go from chronic to acute. And this transition is not inevitable. If with a lot of hard work, it, it can be prevented. So let me uh, end up with the way we started. Um, so here's now at age 31, now age 34, still doing these kinds of things. My point is not just that exercise is good for you and not just that it's a test of lung function, but there can't be anything really terrible about this form of treatment. Because if you look at the um, performance here, these are the percentiles versus people with, who don't have cystic fibrosis. So it seems to me if you're in the 95th percentile overall in a, um, in a, a, a grueling a sprint triathlon, that probably means your lungs are okay, and um, better than mine. So um, that's all I have to say, and um, I hope there was at least one person with a newly diagnosed child who can take full advantage of this. Thank you. So I have a 19-year-old son with cystic fibrosis. And in 2008, when you gave the plenary talk, this plenary talk, I heard it. And um, it saved my son listening to that talk. So um, in the first 10 years of his life, so he's delta, uh, double delta, sweat chloride 108. Uh, his first non-mucoid pseudomonas which was at 20 months. His BMI was low, all indicators of severe disease. In the first 10 years of his life, he dropped 2.7 points per year. By age 10, he was in the high uh, upper 70s uh, for his FEV1. And um, I heard your talk. Um, and uh, also his physician who agreed to put, well, who, dis, um, who suggested putting him on oral antibiotics as well. So since... 2006 when we changed centers after the outcome data became public about the best centers we changed and because of that change um, his physician treated his chronic MRSA infection that he had from age 4 to 11 with constant oral antibiotics alternating septra and doxycycline and then also um, because of your talk we put him on um, uh, chronic uh, case Toby and then Kasten. Uh, so he has been maintained with Kasten and Toby and Septra and Doxy since since the age of 10. Well, Kasten wasn't quite avail available then. But um, and what happened during adolescence when they tend to get worse is his lung function went up 4.7 points per year and is now at 110% um, and does CrossFit every day. And uh, it's because of this. Thank you. And I, 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 do, I, I don't understand why we're not more aggressive in the CF community. My, my own personal take is that um, I, I believe that the, the antibiotic resistance is um, overestimated, the fear is overestimated, and it is because the daily decision making doesn't match the severity of the disease, and I think that that implicit bias exists because it's an invisible disease, and it is a slowly progressive disease as opposed to rapidly progressive. And so we have not been aggressive enough. I, I'm not, I don't understand why we haven't done studies on aerosolized antibiotics in people who are, um, uh, don't necessarily have pseudomonas. I don't, I don't get why we haven't done that. In fact, he had three isolated non-mucoid pseudomonas at age 20 months, at age 4 years, and at age 10 years. He's 19, still no pseudomonas, still no chronic infection. No pseudomonas since age 10. And his MRSA is eradicated. I want to understand, is, is your son in Tali every month? Or 
or one month every only? Every month, other month could be every other month patient, every other month Sutra, every other month Doxy. He's been on those antibiotics now for 10 years, um, nine years, nine years. So the first thing I want to say is congratulations. The second thing I want to say is thank you very much. But I also want to clarify two points. Uh, there's a million things that are left out of a talk like this, and so uh, uh, this is, gives me a chance to say it. So inhaled antibiotics are, are good for the reasons I said, but there are definitely conditions in which they're inadequate. So if, for example, a pneumonia develops and the lower airways are involved, and you can't reach them with an inhaled antibiotic, then you need a systemic antibiotic, either oral or IV. And that was certainly the case with my daughter. She would have not made it through some of these infections if it weren't for those kind of in interventions. I meant to say that, and, I, and you gave me the opportunity to say that now. And the second thing is, um, uh, so one reason, I think, that optimal, what we consider to be optimal treatments aren't given has to do with things like insurance, right? So we had terrific insurance. But even with all the insurance that we had, we still would encounter uh, resistance where people would say, you're too healthy and we're not giving you antibiotics. So, so both things apply, but for a lot of, I think there are a lot of parents out there who would love to do all of this, and there are a lot of physicians out there who would love to do all this, but they can't pay for it. And the sad part about it is his care is now cheaper because up until the age of 13, he had 25 IV courses of antibiotics, zero cents. Oh, so thank you. That gives me, so this is another point that I want to make. So. People used to say the antibiotic treatment is too expensive and we're not going to pay for it. But we now have on record that people are willing to pay $307,000 a year for a treatment for CF. So why isn't that the new standard, All right? So I've, the antibiotics are not going to come anywhere near that. So that's, these are questions that you can address to people who actually are in the trenches making these real decisions day by day. All right, thanks very much. are for a day, but um, I'm going <laughs> to try to limit them. One is, uh, you talk about the elixir of the airway health. Yes. And is there any studies that indicate what will help a person with CF increase that uh, production? Is the immune system, is, do we know anything about it? Um, yes. So, um, so the thing that will increase that the most, the thing that will actually make those glands work really well, is to fix CFTR. So Ivacaftor, Umacaftor, and the following drugs are going to restore the normal function uh, of your airways. They're going to restore it. It doesn't, it's going to restore it in the nose. They're going to restore it in the glands. They're going to restore it in the surface epithelium and in the kidneys and in the liver and everywhere. So those are where we're all putting our help. So uh, for making the glands work better without those things, um, one of the things that seems to work a little bit, it's not great, is probably that's one of the things that exercise is helping to do. Some of those other pathways are activated by things like exercise. And so in addition to all of its other benefits, that helps mobilize mucus and probably also puts more antimicrobials into it. It's a complicated story, by the way, about why the antimicrobials are not working. They're there. They're, they don't go away. They're still there, but they don't work properly. Mm -hmm. And another question that I have in, in related to uh, Lon's um, treatment is uh, Canada has um, 12 years ahead of us, it's, uh, the same Switzerland. They are 52 average of life expectancy. Do we know why is that? Uh, uh, in my opinion, or what I have read, Canada and the United States have very similar mutations. So it, it probably the difference is not genetic. Is it because they are treating different in these countries? Or do you have any? I, I don't know. 
Rick or, or Dennis may, may have a view on that. Okay, thank you. Okay, before I ask my question, I'll put on my CFRI hat to say, if you do have a comment, please wait for the microphone because we're recording. So for sound quality, it's important, just a reminder to everybody. And I just wanna quickly come back to your infection starts high, moves low. And as a daughter, my daughter has CF, she's had four sinus surgeries and she does try and do regular you know, sinus flushes, et cetera. But my question is about antibiotics. I know someone who regularly uses antibiotics in the sinus flush. It's not something my daughter does, but is that something that is standard protocol in certain centers? So I know only a little bit about it. First of all, that's what we always did. Um, but uh, I know that there's a center in Belgium, uh, a guy there named Mainz, who's pushed this very hard. Uh, and they have had terrific success. They, he's published a paper showing people who will come into the clinic with pseudomonas in the nose, but not in the lower airways, so they treat the nose. Um, I, again, Dennis and Rick could speak to how frequently we check for infections in the nose. It's very, by the way, I've focused on pseudomonas because that's uh, what this, uh, what our daughter had, but um, uh, there are other bacteria, um, a staph is a big one, and that's very complicated because a lot of people have staph growing normally in their noses, so it gets to be, uh, it's trickier than it seems at first. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, so I just wanted to clarify something um, about the antibiotics. So are you suggesting that, I mean, I think we all know we want to treat infections early, but are you suggesting, you know, you should, a, a normal, healthy individual should be on inhaled antibiotics, with, like without any sign? I'm just, I'm actually asking your opinion, I know. Is that what you're suggesting? Um, so, so we started out doing it only after colds, uh, but then we switched to basically what's called prophylactic antibiotics. And the reason for that is, given the growth rate of, of bacteria in the airways, you would have to, and given my concern that you have to start early, you would have to be doing cultures weekly. And since that's not practical, prophylactic is okay. The second thing is, um, the second point is that where this has been tried in the past, they used a single antibiotic, and mm -hmm. of course, that doesn't work. So if you're gonna use prophylactics, you wanna do multiple. Uh, there's, a, again, a clinic in Belgium that has a spectacular track record so far, again, maybe Dennis and Rick can speak to this, uh, where they have, um, unlike the picture that you saw from Wisconsin, they have an extremely low rate of pseudomonas infections uh, in their clinic as a result of prophylactic use of antibiotics. It's very controversial, extremely controversial. But again, these are these would be inhaled, not. Okay, Thank I think you. that's my time. It's definitely up now.